Welcome to Evidence for Faith. Michael Lane, your host. So glad you're joining us today as we're exploring the last in our series here on Give Me a Reason to Believe. Again, this was the series that we just recently uh, hosted down on the Florida Keys trip that we have, the Marine Biology trip that we take every Easter going down to the Florida Keys. I've been doing those for, since 1987. Hope you will join us sometime. It's open to high school age and up. Um, you want to learn about marine biology, learn more about God, want to learn about the science behind everything and how cool God is as a designer and creator. That's a trip you got to come on. But anyway, today what we're going to be talking about is evidence. You want a reason to believe? Here's some evidence from science itself. Now, many times people will say to me that science has disproved the Bible. How many times I've heard this? And well, let's just say this. First of all, it is true that the Bible is not a science textbook. It's not a science textbook. Never claims to be a science textbook. The, this is a science textbook. This is a science textbook. They're different. They're not the same thing. The Bible is not a science textbook. Um, and there are, sometimes there have been throughout history, uh, times when the Bible says something scientifically, yet uh, it goes against what science says. So people will say, oh, science is correct, the Bible's wrong. But what almost always happens, um, and keeps happening all the time, is how what we do see in here concerning science, what God gave us in this word, there's not a lot of science in here, but at times there are scientific facts that are mentioned in here from a perfect and holy God. Now the thing is, if he said it and he's perfect and he's holy, what he's put in here is going to be true. Even if science says it's wrong, it's, it comes out that this is true. And we have a whole series on this, a, an entire series, video series. We can go more into detail. It's called Science in the Bible. It's on our website. It's a video series where I take many science disciplines. There's like 12 different lessons in this thing, different disciplines of science, showing you how science has disagreed with the Bible. Only finally, and sometimes it takes centuries for this to happen, but science finally comes around and says, you know something? The Bible had it right all along. Well, that's what we're going to look at today. Today we're going to do a little popcorn section of that series that we did on science and the Bible. And just to show you as we go through this, and let me tell you to begin with, there's not one, not one provable science error in here. Now, there are some scientists that will say, I think that the Bible's wrong here. Well, that's not a, a factual statement, you think. There are some things in science we just haven't found. But the thing is, if God said it, his record is perfect. So I'm going to go with what this says, which I will show you as other people have too as we've gone through things. So in this lesson, we're going to examine some scientific topics where the Bible has disagreed with what the science of the day was saying only for science to finally come around and say, you know, the Bible was correct. Science was wrong. And it's really interesting because we live in a day today that we want to use science like as a religion. Like you have to believe in science. Science is the source of all truth. Really? You got scientists can't agree on the color of an orange basically today. So you can't really go by that. But there are absolute truths and there are scientific facts. And there are a few in here that we're going to look at in here. As I say, it's not a science textbook, but what's in here is going to be accurate. So what we're going to do as we go through this, this lesson here for like the next half hour or so, we're going to look at different disciplines of science. What I'm going to start off with is a science error. I'll give you the discipline we're going to be talking about, and then I will tell you the error that science said that goes against what the Bible said. That science says, no, the Bible's wrong. This is what we know from science. This is truth. Only then, we're going to take a look right after that at what the Bible says. I'm going to give you a passage in the Bible, in some cases more than one, that will show you that what science has been saying for centuries was wrong and eventually came around to actually uh, understand and agree that the Bible was, uh, was correct all along. So that's how we're going to do this. We're going to take a look at different subjects and stuff, and I have some different textbooks in here that I'll hold up at times and just show you where it's coming from and stuff like this. But anyway, let's begin with this first one. Let's go to the field of astronomy. And in astronomy, um, I don't have an astronomy book here, but I do have, and I used to teach earth science um, when I taught middle school uh, years and years ago. And every earth science book that I've had always has an astronomy section in here. And we're going to go with astronomy first. So here's the science error. So number one, first science error we're going to cover in here. 
the stars are countable. The stars are countable. As a matter of fact, science said for centuries that there were only 1,026 stars in the entire universe. 1,026. Now, how they came up with that number, I'll give you in a second, but let's take a look at what the Bible says to begin with. Now, I'm going to take this out of the God's Word translation. Normally, I use the English Standard Version, which is a word-for-word -word, uh, translation of the Bible. Going back to the oldest manuscripts we have, translating each one word by word. They're always not easy, uh, the easiest to read, a thought for thought, like the NIV, the NLT. Um, those are a little easier, but I'm going to use here the God's Word translation. It's a very nice translation. Um, it's sort of like a middle ground between word-for-word -word and a thought for thought. So it sits in the middle there. And looking at Jeremiah, we're going to start with the, the book of Jeremiah. And in Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 22, we read this. I, this is God speaking, I will multiply the descendants of my servant David and the Levites who serve me like the stars of heaven that cannot be counted and the sand on the seashore that cannot be measured. Now, there's... That's, that's the statement. You see, the, the facts now. Let's get to the facts. The facts are, God's Word tells us that the number of stars is immeasurable. It's not limited. There's not a certain number of stars. Today, today scientists actually know and estimate. They just have to estimate. There's no way of knowing how many stars knowing of how many stars there are, but when they put the space telescope up there, the Hubble Space Telescope, they were amazed at how many stars there were. And today we know it is impossible to count the stars. They estimate that there's over 100 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Yet for centuries, science said that there were only like 1,026. And how they came up with that number? There was a guy by the name of Ptolemy back... Um, and uh, the early back in ancient history during the time of the Roman Empire, early Roman Empire, and he came up with this idea of trying to count the stars. So he went out in his backyard, I guess one night, maybe got a bucket of chicken or a pizza, and laid down on a on a blanket and started just counting them. And he came out with about that number. And then um, that went on, and that's what was taught in all major universities for the longest time was that number. And then when we get to about the time of Copernicus, they, you know, Copernicus thinks, you know, I'm wondering. I think he double counted some of those. And he actually came up with something like 1,014. He said, yeah, uh, Ptolemy, he double counted some. So right around a little over 1,000 stars is what science taught as fact for a century. Even though the Bible says, no, you can't count them. There's too many to count. Yet <laughs> you would see in every major university that they were actually saying, no, you can't count them. What do we see here? God's telling Jeremiah 2,400 years ago, you can't count the stars. And that is what is true today. And by the way, you might talk about, well, you know, that verse also mentioned that the sand of the seashore is incountable. Well, there's, there's too many. Well, that's true. I mean, we have fish all around the, um, in Florida and parts of the Gulf of Mexico along the East Coast called parrotfish. Parrotfish, and plus all through the, the tropical oceans, it's a coral reef type fish. Parrotfish eat coral. They grind it up with their teeth and, excuse me, but they poop out sand. So sand is being added and sand is being consumed by erosion, breaking it down. But sand is constantly fluctuating in the number, exactly as the Bible says. Does it get any cooler than that? Oh, it does. Final conclusion on this one. Bible is correct. Science is wrong. For science. Let's go to number two. Science error number two. The universe is contained and it has limits. Now, what does this mean? They used to say that the universe was only so big. It, it was just a contained. Matter of fact, some ancient cultures during the time of the Bible, not the Bible itself, but other cultures used to teach that it was, if you could get up high enough, you could probably touch the sky. Um, right, yes. Um, but that's the science era. The, the universe is contained. It has limits. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, again, going to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verse 37. We're going to go back to the English Standard Version here now. It reads, thus says the Lord, if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below can be explored, then I will cast off, uh, cast off all the is, uh, offspring of Israel. But you see what he's saying? It's something he's not going to do. Thus he is saying, you can't measure the universe, is what this is saying. The heavens above cannot be measured. It's impossible. Jeremiah lived around 600 B.C., during that time that he's living, basically every ancient culture, 
on the planet believed that the heavens could actually be measured, that there was an extent, an end to the universe. And that's what they're stating, and that's what they used to, to state all through science. This is what science said. It's measureless. Well, now we know it's not. Uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and uh, the field of physics and astrophysics tells us that the universe is still expanding. It's going out. It is basically like infinite. It just keeps going and it's expanding out. Thus, the Bible was correct. Science was wrong. Let's go to the third one. Also out of an earth science book. I used to teach, as I said, I used to teach earth science. Um, and in one of the, uh, the subjects that we always have to cover every year was having to do with meteorology, certain things in meteorology. Well, the Bible has a lot to say on meteorology. Um, I don't know if you're interested in that type of a science outside of just watching a weatherman on, on the news or something like that, um, or downloading an app on your phone to get the weather, but there's a lot in the Bible having to do with meteorology. And this one, this is number three, science error number three that the science had wrong for so many centuries. The wind, the wind moves at random in an unorganized pattern. That was the science facts for century. Wind just came, blew, and then it just disappeared. Came, blew here, disappeared. It was extremely random. There was no organization to it at all. Yet, what does the Bible say about that? In Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 1, verse 6, we read from the Bible this. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Round and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. Now, what is this talking about? The data here. Now, this is Ecclesiastes. This was written by Solomon around 950 B.C. So this is a long time ago, like 3,000 years ago. And he is stating here that the air is moving on a course. Actually, the movement is designed as a circuit. A circuit, like in electri electronics, a circuit is a course where uh, electrons flow. So it's a design course. And that is the same thing portrayed here, that the earth, uh, the winds on the earth are moving in a circuit. Now, again, you watch a... a a weather broadcast on television, they'll show you like weather fronts and they'll show you a low pressure system, high pressure system, and how the winds rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise, depending upon which one of those systems it is. But the thing is, they all move. Matter of fact, when I used to teach elementary school, I remember teaching my students um, about wind patterns and how with when a low pressure system comes in, you usually get rain. High pressure system comes in, you have fair weather. And so by looking at the clouds, and the direction of the wind, we monitored this for days and went out into the schoolyard. Now I'm talking, these are like uh, third and fourth graders. Yes, I used to teach grades like that. I'm sure kids like that are probably in therapy today, having me as their teacher. But anyway, we went outside and we had the students with a compass try to figure out, okay, which way is the wind blowing? And we had little flags that we set out there and they were seeing and looking at that. And then we came inside the room and after taking the data down, we walk inside the room and I show them our area with a weather map and showing how we have, well, I feel like a weatherman here, and how there would be, okay, a low system, the, the, the winds are gonna blow one way, if it's a high pressure system, they blow another way. And they were able to predict what the weather was gonna be like just by doing it, it's so simple. And it's exactly what the Bible says. We know that science, uh, the, the science of the Bible here is absolutely correct. So final conclusion on this one, the Bible is correct, science was wrong. Let's go to number four. Again, dealing with meteorology. As I said, a lot of meteorology in the Bible. And I used to use the Bible for this one um, when I used to teach about air pressure and stuff. In um, the science era is this. They would state, and they stated this for centuries, Air has no weight. Air doesn't weigh anything. Well, um, I have in, in our video series, we actually demonstrate what I did in a classroom showing like there is weight. You can actually weigh air. You can do this. And on presentations, when I've gone to churches or to organizations and have talked about science in the Bible, I have demonstrated this right in front of people. Um, there's little simple experiments that you can do to prove that air has weight. It's not empty, nothing. There is weight here. Now, that's what the science air is. They said, science said for century, air has no weight. Yet, you go to the Bible, you look in the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, chapter 28, verse 25, and you read, when he gave to the wind its weight, and apportioned the waters by measure. But 
the wind its weight, air is weight. Now this verse is actually stating that wind or air, if you will, has a weight to it. There is weight. Now, what is the, the Hebrew word here being used for weight is the word mishkal. Mishkal actually means to take like a balance and put things like um, people in, at the markets would have balances as buying so much of weight of something, like how many shekels and stuff, they would weigh it out on a balance, on a scale. That's the exact same word that's being used here. And air does have weight to it because it's made of molecules. They didn't know back at that time about that kind of thing. And so science for centuries said, no, air doesn't have weight. But the Bible specifically says in the book of Job, it does have weight. It literally can be measured on a balance is what this is talking about. Final conclusion on this one, the Bible is correct, er, science is wrong. Let's go to number five. Another science air. oh, this, this one is just absolutely amazing. And when I used to teach earth science, I would do this. A lot of times I would have my textbook and it would have a section on um, the water cycle. And the thing is, I would sometimes show my students, let me show you something really interesting. And I would tell them, put the way your textbook. I want to read you something out of an ancient book called the Bible. And I'm going to read some passages here. And you're going to see that um, what you read in a science book is exactly now what we see in the Bible. Now, here's the problem. Here's the error. It has to do with the water cycle. The science error was this. Rain and snow just appear and then disappear. That it's a random act. That rain comes down or snow comes down, and then you can see it on the puddles on the, on the sidewalks and stuff, but then it disappears. And what they used to teach at all major universities for centuries, it ceased to exist. It's just gone. That's what was taught for the longest time. Well, what does the Bible say about this? Well, let's go back to Job, the oldest book in the Bible, chapter 36, verse 27 and 28. Listen carefully to this verse. I used to read this when I taught this in school. For he draws up the drops of water. They distill his mist in rain, which the skies pour down and drop on mankind abundantly. You see what we just did? He draws up water. Water vapor is a mist. It distills as a mist. And then the skies pour it down and drop it on mankind. You have the water cycle, or sometimes it's called the hydrologic cycle, perfectly described in those two verses in the book of Job. Isn't that fascinating? And not only that, what I would read besides that passage, Isaiah 55.10, it's described again. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 7. Job, the same, same book, but chapter 26, verse 8. Psalm 135, verse 7. Psalm 33, verse 7. Amos chapter 5, verse 8. All of these passages correctly identify the hydrologic cycle that you see in a modern science book on meteorology. It's discussed of all the science facts that you find in the Bible, and there are many. There's not, you know, a whole lot. It's not a science textbook, but of all the scientific facts, the thing that I have found the most on is this. The hydrologic or water cycle is described the most, and it describes it absolutely perfect. The precipitation falls to the ground. It evaporates. It goes back up into the clouds, forms the clouds, which then come back down again. It's called the water cycle. So the final conclusion on this one? The Bible was correct. Mm, science was wrong. It just doesn't disappear. No, there's a cycle to it. They never understood that until just a couple hundred years ago did they finally get that right. Let's move to a different science. Let's go to oceanography, marine biology, oceanography topics. I used to teach this, and I still do every year when we go down the Florida Keys. Again, you can come with us, a little commercial. Uh, you can come with us down the Florida Keys, and I would love to take you at Easter time and, and let you um, experience education in the outdoors like that. It's fascinating. But there's a couple of science errors the, um, that science taught for years. They were incorrect. Bible says one thing. No, can't trust the Bible. There's science errors, and then they would say, yeah, now we know the Bible was correct on what it says. And here's number six, the first one. The science error, the oceans are still, still, without any major currents. That's what they used to teach. That if there was a current, if a current did exist, it was localized and was possibly just temporary. Now, 
What does the Bible say? In Psalm chapter 8, verse 8, there's a very famous passage here. And it reads, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea. But here's the key. Whatever passes along the paths of the seas. Now, as I said, ocean currents weren't known until, believe it or not, just 1769 A.D. And it was an uncle of Benjamin Franklin who actually discovered the Gulf Stream along the east coast of the United States. Um, ben Franklin then wrote about it. But, um, so they knew that there were some little currents, but they didn't think that they were all over the world. They didn't think they were out in the middle of the ocean and stuff like this. That was against what science was teaching. Science says, no, there aren't none. Uh, there's none out there. If they are, they're temporary and they're random, if, if they even happen. But in 1847, there was a Navy captain, a U.S. Navy captain named Matthew F. Murray. He um, is often today called the father of modern oceanography. He was a Christian. He had utmost faith that this was truth. This is absolute truth. If there's something in here, God said it. God doesn't mis make mistakes. So if God says something, it's true. And he would study his Bible carefully. Not read it like a novel. He would study it. Well, one day he was reading his Bible, and he came across this passage in Psalm 8.8. 8. And he says, wow, this is talking about paths in the sea. He said, that sounds like currents. But science tells us there's not currents. He was so convinced that the Bible was correct and science was wrong that he went to the Navy board and requested use of a ship to sail around the world to try and map ocean currents. I mean, this guy really went on a limb with his faith. He stepped out where science was saying, no, you're wrong. He says, I believe the Bible's true. And he went out there and he discovered ocean currents all over and at various depths, just like the Bible says, paths in the sea. He ends up publishing the first ocean um, booklet of ocean currents all over the world, the wind and the ocean currents. He published it. How did he get all this? By studying the Word of God. He said the Word of God is the source of all truth. And he used the U.S. Navy to help prove it, and he did it. And he publishes that book, and that book is on display today. There Actually, there's many copies of it in different libraries. Final story on this one, the Bible was correct. Science mm, was wrong for centuries. Um, we're not just done there. Let's go to another one here having to do with the oceanography. How about the bottom of the oceans are flat? It's called the abyssal plain. Do you know for centuries, science taught that the ocean floor, like between um, North America and Europe and Africa, was totally flat. It was just an abyssal plain, as it was called. For centuries, they taught this. Yet, in the book of Jonah, chapter 2, verse 5, we read a very interesting statement. It reads, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. This is when Jonah is swallowed by the great fish. You want information on that? We have a whole series on Jonah. You can um, download our podcast and stuff and see this. But the thing is, um, Jonah was swallowed by a great fish, and he's down in the water, and he talks about at the bottom of the seas, he's talking about the roots of mountains. Well... Guess what? It was Captain Murray, who we just mentioned before. He reads this. He's reading a Bible, studying his Bible. He comes across this passage in Jonah. And he believes, again, science has got it wrong. The Bible is correct. He's convinced by reading the Bible that there are mountains in the seas, that it's not totally flat. So again, he goes to the Navy board. He gets approval to do this, and he goes out doing soundings in different places off, I think, I believe, I believe he started around the Canary Islands in the Atlantic, but he started finding out, wow, it's not totally flat. There's mountain ranges and stuff underneath there. And it wouldn't be until, I think it was in 1953, that uh, a fellow by the name of Maurice Ewing actually made the discovery of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, taking some of the work from Matthew Murray that Murray found out that there were mountains there, and he actually mapped it. And it wasn't until 1953. You realize science has been wrong so long, and that's what they found out, that there are indeed mountain ranges under the earth. Matter of fact, the tallest mountain in the world, most people say if you do it on a Jeopardy or trivia game that it's Mount Everest. Mm, incorrect. It's Hawaii. 
Hawaii is the largest mountain. When you measure from the, um, the bottom of the seafloor, that mountain coming up, broaching through the surface and still going up over a thousand feet or so up into, you know, because there's mountains in the Hawaiian Islands, you measure all that distance, it's much greater than what you see on Mount Everest. Mount Everest is not even close to that high. Um, so the Bible is absolutely correct. So final conclusion here, the Bible is correct. Mm. Science was wrong. How about that? Let's go to a different science. One subject I love to teach. For many years, I used to teach human anatomy and physiology. Absolutely love principles in that and physiology. It's one of my favorite subjects um, in studying this. Now, what is fascinating about this one? There are some major goofs <laughs> that science has made. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh. Um, but there are some really major goofs that science has made over the, over the centuries. One of their biggest blunders ever was this one. Blood makes you ill. Yes, I'm, I'll repeat that. Blood makes you ill. Mm -hmm. Those of you who have been in accidents or something had to have immediate blood transfusion. Blood makes you ill. When sick, science used to teach, it is best to remove as much blood from your body as necessary because blood is not necessary for life. Now, if you're containing your laughter, um, that's good because... As we know, um, and physicians and anybody who studies anatomy and physiology today know that blood tissue is extremely important for life. Uh, matter of fact, what does the Bible? What's the Bible say about this? Well, let's go back to about 1450 BC. Uh, God telling Moses, and this is written in the book of Leviticus, chapter 17, verse 11, we read this. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Life is in blood. Blood is necessary for life, in other words. I mean, the Red, the Red Cross even has, what is that slogan that they say? Give life, give blood? Yeah, well, this goes against what science taught for centuries. Did you know that it wasn't until the 1600s AD, 1600 ADs, people did not understand that blood even flowed through the body in vessels, in tubes and stuff, and, and, and that it carried nutrients in waste is what its purpose was. It was William Harvey in the 1600s that conducted, conducted a very famous experiment showing that blood is a major component of life. And even when he proved it through experiments in, in front of a bunch of doctors and stuff, still there were people who didn't believe it. They still said, no, blood is not that necessary. And if somebody's sick, we want to take the blood out of their body. Thus, what they used to use from, from ancient times to even... Till modern times, they would do a process, if you're sick, called bloodletting or commonly called bleeding their patients because they thought by taking the blood out, the blood was actually helping the disease. And so by bloodletting, they would cut, make cuts in the body or they would use leeches to drain it off. Now, today you might be thinking, don't they still do that, do that today? In some cases with um, very serious infections, they will put leeches. It is true. They do this. They take leeches, not out of the wild and like, oh, let's go find a ditch and get a leech. But they're leeches that are used for this in medicine and they'll remove, they'll put the uh, leech there and it will drink the bad infected blood. But what they, the difference here is they used to, if you just got sick, if you had a fever or something, they would cut you and just drain off blood from parts of your body, draining blood. It was called bloodletting. And they thought that the blood was actually helping the disease. I'll give me a classic example of this, how sad this is. The founder of our country, George Washington, his death. It's recorded. You can read this in history books and stuff. It's, um, you can find the whole details because the doctors that treated him wrote everything down, and we still have this to this day. He was suffering. George Washington was out riding his horse just a couple of days before he died. Um, he gets a cold or some type of illness. They called it actually bacterial epiglottitis is what they, they named the disease that he had. But he was suffering from a bacterial infection. So what they did, they called the doctors, and they drained off blood from him. After a while, he didn't get a little better. A couple hours later, mm, let's go back. Let's take some more blood out. A couple hours later, he's still not getting better. Let's take some more blood. So they kept bleeding George Washington until they drained out approximately, because they would measure this, they drained out approximately 35% uh, of his blood. Over a third of his blood volume was removed. And the guy died. Well, duh, he died. 
because he has a bacterial infection, what fights that are white blood cells um, that you find inside your body, uh, lymphocytes and, and leukocytes and, and monocytes. The, the thing is, these things fight these diseases. They were taking them out, taking out of his body the thing that's supposed to be fighting the disease. No wonder he died. And how many other people have died by this? Because that's what they did. Doctors bled him out the last 12 hours of his life, draining out his blood. Then he died. Science now realizes today how unfortunate and how unwise a decision that is to do that. Matter of fact, a lot of times when people get sick, you give them blood. It goes back to just what the Bible said. Life is in the flesh, in the blood. So, final conclusion on this one. The Bible was correct. Mm. Science was wrong. Let's go to one more here. we got time for one more. Let me do one more for you. This is going to come from a field that I used to work in, genetics, though I work primarily in fisheries genetics. Um, this is dealing with human genetics. And I used to teach uh, human genetics in some of my classes. And let's take a look at the science error here. Um, this is number nine as we're going through these. And science used to teach for the longest time. Matter of fact, every now and then I've come across somebody who still believes this. Various races of the human race, right there I have a problem, but anyway, let's move on. Various races of the human race results from descending from various human ancestors. Like some would come from, say, um, some person like a Cro-Magnon or a, um, a Homo habilis or, or a ne Neanderthal or something. They came from different things and from different branches. So you could take, and they used to teach this. Matter of fact, James Watson, one of the co-discoverers of, of DNA, got into trouble just a little over a decade ago again because he used to teach this. And he made a comment that certain people, he was talking about certain races of our planet, um, came from a lower ancestry off the human um this whole idea of humans coming from apes and that they an ape-like creature and so that they came from there and some are inferior to others and so we do have people who still believe this to this day and this is so stupid i'm sorry this is so incorrect scientifically um but this is what they say now what does the bible say let's get get into this first what does the bible say well the bible says a lot on it, but i'm just going to take one passage here um, that I'll mention, and that's going to be Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Now, this is Jesus speaking, who is God. So it's just not in the Bible. This is coming from the mouth of the Lord himself and as Jesus says this. He says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Right there. So he's talking about, going back to the Genesis account, of talking about God creating one man, one woman. I mean, you can read about this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20. But you know, it's also found in the book of Acts. If you have a problem with this, you just, your problem is just not with the book of Genesis. You have problems with many books of the Bible. Exodus has the whole creation account in there. Never hear hardly anybody ever argue about that one. Um, or take a look at Acts chapter 17, verse 26. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. So yeah, there's, there's more than just Genesis 3.20 um, with this. So the Bible states that God created just two individuals who all the people, all descendants of the earth came from. Jesus mentions this. Paul teaches this, that all humans are descendant of one man, one woman. Now, according to Darwinian evolution, they used to teach that the different branches of different early pre-humans caused the different races, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that is not true. Matter of fact, I don't even like to use the term race. We're all one race, homo sapien. And the thing is, what makes a species? You can take, a, biologically speaking, a species is when you can take a male and a female of each one, um, of, a, of a kind of species, put them together, and they make fertile offspring. Same species. It's one of the tests for species. The thing is, um, that's how a species is determined. And even to this day, there are different, yes, there are different um, types of people of, of Homo sapien around. I mean, when you look at an um, aborigine from Australia to a um, North American Indian or to uh, a um, person from, say, Norway or uh, a person from the Caribbean, basically they can all mate and produce fertile offspring, thus showing we're all the same species. But for a long time, 
science has said, no, we came from different type of humans. So there's a superior race and others. Now, we, we don't like so talking about that today because science is saying that in most cases, science says that is not true. We came from one male, one female. Do you know even National Geographic agrees with that? Because they've done specials on this. Back in the 1990s, the world was shocked when an article was published in a respected magazine called Science. This is not a Christian publication, but Science magazine publishing that we are all descended from one female. They gave her a name called Mitochondrial Eve. The way they determined her and the reason they call her Mitochondrial Eve has nothing really to do with the Bible. Um, but what they were saying is they studied all the different cultures on the earth, all over the planet, and they took mitochondrial DNA, like a, a swab from a cheek uh, or a blood sample, and then comparing it, because mitochondrial DNA, you basically inherit from your mother. Um, it's used a lot in forensic science and stuff today, but we inherit it from our mother. So by doing this, uh, many scientists thought, wow, we can trace, using mitochondrial DNA, we can trace back how many females we came from and what they found out is we all descend from one female so then it was figuring out well what's the age when did this person live and their first number that they first published they made a mistake because they were using mitochondrial dna instead of the in, and that's what they were using but what they did is they used the mutation rates of linear nuclear dna they mutated different rates, but they didn't catch that at first, when it first came out. As soon as they published it, there were many geneticists that we realized, and I did too, because I remember when the, that article came out, because um, it came out like 180,000 years ago, she lived, and I was like, something's not right here because they're using mitochondrial DNA, yet the mutation rate they're using is from a different type of DNA, uh, nuclear DNA. They don't mutate at the same rates. They, this is a flaw in the test, or in their data and analysis. And um, as I did this, I checked with some geneticist friends of mine, they caught the same thing. And people, um, other scientists started uh, arguing with them, you guys made a mistake here. So they went back, and this is published in Science, um, volume 279, um, from January 2nd of 1998, and it also appears in Nature Genetics, volume 15, pages 363 to 368, and that was published in 1997. Both those magazines Magazines, they reworked the study using mitochondrial DNA mutation rates and they came out, are you ready, that this Eve, this mitochondrial Eve as they called her, would have lived closer to around 6,500 years, give or take a little bit of time there, but right around 6,500 years ago, which fits, guess what, more with the biblical aspect of than the earth being billions of years old. Wow, how about that? The Bible was correct. We do all come from one female. That's been substantiated through many scientific studies. Matter of fact, they went on and did a whole thing on the chromosome uh, Y, and they found out that all males uh, are descended from one male. Cool. So you can find that, but we don't have time to go through all these studies and stuff on this. But the whole point is that I'm making here is the Bible was correct all the time on this. And even Nature Genetics and Science Magazine, not Christian publications, but very respected, peer-reviewed uh, um, uh, publications all stated that, and it lines up with what the Bible says. The Bible was correct. Science was wrong. Well, if I've whet your appetite for more information on all this stuff, please go to our website, download our series, Science in the Bible. Uh, there are some very detailed lessons in there where I go into great, great information. And go ahead and check it out. And we would love to hear from you. I hope you've enjoyed this series because this wraps up the series that we did in the Florida Keys. Um, give me uh, a reason to believe. Well, I think I have done that. I hope that you now realize the Word of God is true. It's not false that there is a God. The Bible is accurate. It can be trusted. Jesus is the Messiah, and everything he says is true, and he says he's the only way to get to the Father. That means he's the only way to get to the Father, and that comes through repentance. That was the message that Jesus gave to the unsaved, was to repent and turn to him for salvation. And I hope you have done that. If you have any comments or questions, or even questions on salvation, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if not, um, 
please get involved and I hope you get into a good church that is teaching the accuracy of this. There's a lot of false prophets going around today, false teachers on the Word of God. Get involved in a church that really teaches the truth about the Word of God. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining uh, us on our journey here on Give Me a Reason to Believe. And like I say, I pray that now you have many reasons to believe the Bible is true. So until we meet again, take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.